Hey, what's going down, y'all? Listen, you guys, before you watch this video, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you're clicking on the notification bell so you know each and every time a new episode is released or a new video is uploaded. I'm Fitch. See you guys on the other side. Get your ass off the fence and subscribe right now. Right now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robin Hood, <laughs> also known as a Robin Hood. I love that name, by the way. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. How are you doing today? I am wonderful. I am so fabulous. I don't know where to begin. I'm, I've learned to count my blessings, even the micro blessings. You understand what I'm saying? So the micro blessings. I like that. Yes, absolutely. Well, you glowing. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You know, I had to do a little something. Just get together a little something, you know. Just, just a little something, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you you are what we consider to be a, a pretty dope person. You have helped uh, thousands of people learn how to become six-figure entrepreneurs. And yeah. I think that is awesome in itself when you think about the formula that most people use to equate success. Uh, so, but I want to start with you as a yes. person, you know, uh, wh where are you from and how did you chart and start this journey? Oh, goodness. So I'm from Port Arthur, Texas, originally born and raised. Um, I don't know if I'm looking at my screen or if I'm looking at my camera head. <laughs> um, originally from Port Arthur, Texas, um, Trillville, same place UGK is from. So we have a, we have actually a lot of celebrities that come out of uh, PA. But um, that's where I'm originally from. Um, but I've lived in so many different places, including Atlanta, Georgia. I've lived in Arkansas. I've lived in a lot of different places and I've traveled a lot. So, um, but how did I get started in financial services specifically. Um, I started teaching financial literacy uh, over 10 years ago. So um, when I was in my early 20s, if I'm not giving away my age, uh, I started a nonprofit. And the nonprofit basically uh, focused on financial literacy and life skills and entrepreneurship. And so I started teaching financial literacy, partnered with so many different um, amazing corporations like Wells Fargo, Capital One, um, um, Dell, Coca-Cola, and hires of Bush. I mean, over 12 different uh, Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies. And just through those partnerships, I just was able to get our mission out there and help as many youth and young adults and eventually start helping families too, because we started helping uh, families who were uh, trying to get homes for Habitat for Humanity, but they had to have so many hours of financial literacy to qualify. Mm -hmm. So um, started there. And I mean, ever since then, I've just been continually trying to take my own personal wealth game up a few notches and anytime I learn I give so all right so let's talk about financial literacy uh yeah. quite a few years ago I did a uh tour with Hill Harper mm -hmm. and, uh, sponsored by UNCF and the uh, Wachovia Foundation which is now the Wells Fargo's Foundation yes um and that's one of the things we focus on was financial mm -hmm. literacy and we we, we kind of went around the colleges all the UNCF colleges which was great Yes. What is the thing you find interesting when it comes to teaching people financial literacy about what they already don't know? Oh, I found everything interesting. Um, I think the idea to go to your family for financial mm -hmm. literacy is not always the best idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's putting it nicely. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's the first, that's my very first aha moment is mm -hmm. that you look at families, you meet with people, you meet with single moms, single dads, full, you know, two parent households, you meet with these different individuals. Most people have no idea of who they really should be talking to when they're mm -hmm. starting their journey. And you should not be talking to someone who has, has not had the type of success that you want to see in your own life. And that success could be, again, it could be micro. It could be very micro. It could be very little as in, how do I save my first thousand dollars? You know, but if you're talking to someone who has never saved a thousand dollars and who is always at the pawn shop, I mean, you might be talking to the wrong person, you know? And so, and, and I say might, because I, I understand, you know, people go through things and life happens. And I'm not, I'm not one of those people who feel like once you've made it, you've made it forever. Cause it's not true. We, we watch people get, money and 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 die broke you know right, they just, right. there's 
there's different levels to life. But if you've met somebody who is in a very hard place in their life, and I'm just saying this to cover everybody, um, if they're in a hard place in their life, but they know how to save that thousand dollars, you can still listen to them too. You, mm. you see what I'm saying? Uh, but it just, your best bet is to go with somebody who is licensed. Someone who is licensed, who can tell you exactly what you need to do. Laws change, regulations change. And we are one of the most highly regulated industries ever <laughs> when it comes to financial mm. services and money. So. so let's get this straight. Robin says, if you want to save a thousand dollars, you should never listen to someone who's never saved a hundred dollars. If they ain't say ten dollars, bitch. You understand what I'm saying? If they are okay, 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 okay. See, I love talking about this, so you have to like calm me down a little bit sometimes, okay? Will me no, back. Rip it up, right? rip it up, turn it up okay. some more. So listen, I heard this amazing person on Clubhouse who is a billionaire and his name is, um, oh God, let me look up his, can I look up his name real quick on my phone? Um, I'm going to tell you what he said. He broke it down in such a eloquent way. He said, poor people's main priority is to pay bills. Uh, That's their main priority for money is to pay, but they get paid on Friday. Let me make sure all my bills are paid. That's their main priority of money. Now, do they have other priorities for mo their money? Absolutely. They do whatever, right? You know, go out, you know, treat themselves, whatever, right? Pay yeah. the babysitter, you know, whatever. That's still a bill, but so, you know, so, but the, the, the next priority the, or the next class of people is the middle class. Okay. And the middle class, their main priority for money is to maintain good credit, okay? Yeah. That's their main priority. Don't worry about bills. Let's make sure my credit is A1, all right? But then there's a third class of people that we're all aspiring to. And I can't even say all, but most of us, especially entrepreneurs, right. are aspiring to. And that is that seven-figure, eight-figure, ten-figure person, the wealthy person who has already, already made it to a level of success that mm -hmm. we just haven't quite gotten there yet, right? But their main priority of money is to invest, is to make their money, make mm. more money. And then we're going to pay our bills. And then we're going to make sure our credit is right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was just like, it was one of the most fascinating things. And I probably did not do it justice as much as he did. But when he said it, it was like, oh my God, that is just so good. I mean, but you hear it so many different ways by so many different people. Right. But he, he did it. He did it justice. Though. He he did it. Now, the thing with that, and I think that's a great, that's a great outlook. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think when you're talking about people who are poor versus middle class versus those who are already wealthy mm -hmm. is that mindset when it comes to that. Because yes. the poor people will say, oh, of course, you can think about investing when you got plenty of money to invest. Yeah. I barely got enough to pay the bills that I'm really yeah. concerned about. So, yeah. you know, you have to have a, a balance to teach them how to go from barely having enough to having more than in the yeah. so that they can chart that course because yeah. i said this a thousand times before it's easy to give advice to people when you're doing better than them yes you know? absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know? yeah um it, and it, it's crazy go ahead yeah um and and just my response to those types of ideologies that of course is easier for me to say because I finally made, you know, my own six figures and, you know, I know what that feels like now, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you this, when I was working with all those corporate sponsors, I was on food stamps. Mm -hmm. I was a single mom living on section eight with my mom. Wow. And, and as a matter of fact, I inherited her section eight when she unfortunately passed. Oh. So, and, I, and here's a little, another little backstory, and that's why I love these kind of interviews. Another little backstory, and, you know, my sister, <laughs> my brother, like, everybody was a, a witness to this. You know, when you have a press conference, you try to offer water, you try to offer these snacks and whatever. They didn't know I had used my EBT card to pay for the water. So I had the mayor drinking EBT water. I had <laughs> the woman drinking EBT water. So don't tell me, don't tell me what you cannot do. Right. Tell me what you can do. Tell me what you're willing to sacrifice. And then we can have a conversation. But we cannot have a conversation if you feel like all you have is $50 and you can't go anywhere else. No, you're going to mm -hmm. have to learn how to sacrifice just a little bit more. Be homeless. Tyler Perry was homeless. If he can do it, you can do it. Like, we got to, we really got to go there. Like, Did you just say be homeless? Hungry. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you're hungry, you're hungry, Finch, period. <laughs> did, did you just suggest they become homeless? <laughs> I, said, I said, whatever your next level is, listen, all the money you will ever have is in the hands of somebody else. You got to figure out how to get that. And you got to figure out how to get there. You got to figure out the business plan, whatever. If you have to miss a couple of Starbucks or a couple of, you know, you got to be a little late on the bill or something. I mean, you like you have to be creative. Like that's what they call bootstrapping. And that's what I did for my nonprofit. I bootstrapped my way to success. Like mm -hmm. literally, I literally bootstrapped. So I think that's why I have a very <laughs> strong stance. And I absolutely love financial literacy and talking about money and financial services and investing and just all mm -hmm. that. Cause that's, it's my story. Like I'm not telling you some some kind of uh published book that you know went to number one and i'm telling you what i've never done no i was in the mud like when right. i made my first six figures i was in the mud i was there so that's why i like talking to people who like you gotta have like a little hope if you have a little hope i could push you i could push you enough to get you to where your next goal is so now now you said something very interesting that i was not aware of okay uh, you can inherit Section 8. I mean, I'm yeah. trying to figure out who inherited my mother's when she passed away 21 years ago. Who got listen, that? Listen, <laughs> listen, hunty, hunty, let me tell you. You can inherit whatever they got, okay? If it's a penny, it's yours. You understand what I'm saying? And I had that lady, which who ironically became my friend, <laughs> um, our caseworker. She um, <laughs> she called me and she was like, listen, it's yours now. What you going to do with it? You know? I was like, <laughs> Well, I guess I use it, you know. Let me see. I mean, do we give do we give sexual aid away? I mean, I don't know. So yeah, I do what I had to do. <laughs> so who did you who did you gift it to? <laughs> well, I didn't. I was I, as as a matter of fact, I uh what they call um uh, not aged out Jesus, but your income, when your income reaches a certain limit, like yeah. you can't even get it anymore. And I basically earned my way out I of poverty. That. So yeah. That is awesome. All right, yeah. so let's talk about some of your life challenges. You mentioned a few just coming mm -hmm. up, but we're not talking about the ones before you got there because people think oftentimes we only going to have, I call them life's hurdles. Yeah. Oh, I'm only going to have hurdles getting there. No, you're going to have some once you get to, get to your right. objective and Ooh, then you're going to have some more as you progress on. So let's talk about some of those life's hurdles that you've endured even after earning your way out of Section 8. Oh, Finch, I swear you are preaching a day, baby. Listen, uh, <laughs> hey, listen, listen, I could do a shout right there. Listen, the, the one of the biggest lies I learned is that when you become successful and you get so much money, most of like, all, or if not all your problems go away, like you, you'll have like little problems, but really you made it. There's mm. no such thing, though. Like the more success I had, the more connections I had, the more favor I had, the more blessings I had, the more responsibility I had and the more I had to risk. And other people who are watching you, who are trying to figure out how in the world did you get there and they know who you were in your past. Mm -hmm. They knew you was a struggle, a struggling single mom. They knew you was on food stamps. They knew you was on section. Eight. They trying to figure out. And if they crabs in a bucket, baby, you better run. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so I will tell you probably one of my biggest, um, uh, one of my biggest challenges when I made my very first six figures, which was actually in 2018, mm -hmm. my very first six figures, my son was diagnosed with autism. Oh. Now, get this. First of all, it was very hard. I would, when I say I was trying to get pregnant, I was like, Lord, I know you got one for me. Like, I know you got a good one for me. You got a good old bundle of joy somewhere. I don't know how, I don't know how it's going to happen. But I mean, I, when I tell you I was putting in the work, I was putting in <laughs> the work. <laughs> I, I, I was like, it just wasn't happening. And I was like, God, like, okay, if it's my turn, it's my turn. And then eventually I got mad at God and I was like, ah. It ain't going to happen. And as soon as I got mad at God, that's when I got pregnant. So my little son, my little king, he did not come easy. Mm -hmm. But I tell you this, the year that my business hit a trajectory that put me in four, I, I literally my I literally made my first $40,000 within six weeks. Okay. And so what happened is I'm making this money. I'm getting all these clients. I'm like my business is going crazy. I went from three different states to over 18 different states within a year. Okay. Actually under a year. And so I have all this business success, 
But I was noticing that my son was not responding to me when I would call his name. Mm -hmm. like, his name is Joey Ali. I call him Ali. Mm -hmm. And I was like calling his name. Like, what is what is this? Like, he's just not he's not responding, not looking, not dancing, like nothing is getting his attention. And then he kept having all these other red flags. And so I eventually took him to the doctor. And I'm like, listen. The kid's not responded to me. He acts like he doesn't even hear me at times. So we went through all the tests, you know, for his ears and tried to see, okay, is he deaf or hard of mm. hearing or, you know, like, what is it? And lo and behold, he has autism. And so when I tell you I was devastated, like I was devastated. And I was devastated in such a way um, to where I couldn't even drive after that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So when I tell you it's been a journey even ever since then, like he still doesn't sleep at night. He doesn't eat, you know, like regular normal kids. Like he's very sensory avert. He has sensory aversions, but he also have um, a lot of sensory seeking uh, challenges too, because he loves mm -hmm. to climb everything. Like he's like, he's all boy, <laughs> but with his own little quirks. But I mean, it, it rocked my world and it happened literally months after i had made like that very first mm -hmm. money you know to come in and, and get all these clients and you know you see me on social media here and there and i'm like you know everything's going great but at home i was terrified because i told my daughter who's older than him uh, she's 14 now i told my daughter i was like i don't know if i can be the same mom to you that what you know or to him that i could be or that i was to you mm -hmm. and i just kind of just cried about it because i was like i it takes a suit like superhero powers to to really manage what um, autism moms uh, manage on a daily basis. So. so, so let's 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 talk about. I mean, because that can be challenging, uh, and mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about your children. You know, this is yes. most people say, "Hey, this is who I'm doing it for," right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So you, you're thinking about those challenges, and you have to still maintain the success you've accumulated as a business yes. owner, as a serial entrepreneur, because most people don't. When you work for a company, you have a lot of cushion. Oh, when yes. You, when oh. you work for yourself, that cushion is thin. Baby. Yeah. I, that, I really learned that with my nonprofit. It kind of gave me the, uh, the that that ground to learn from because although it's not for profit like you still become the ceo the secretary mm -hmm. and just all these different things same is true with the for profit you know you still carry all these roles as an entrepreneur um that you eventually have to learn how to delegate and hire and build a team so if you don't do that you will drown and you will not be able to scale at all so so for you mm -hmm. the ultimate goal was what when you got started um, the ultimate goal for me um, in financial services, I still have not gotten it. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> that's good. That's good to just say that. That's good yeah, that. I mean, I'm a very transparent person. And I have not reached that goal yet. Um, but I... <laughs> I am. I just, you know, I, I just got to keep going. I just got to keep going. Um, so, but my, my goal is my first million. Like that is, that's my goal, you know? And so um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to make it, especially now. Like, I mean, listen, before the pandemic, life insurance and retirement and all that, that was like, it was super challenging. Mm -hmm. Listen, after the pandemic, people have realized their mortality, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and it's unfortunate, but it's like, if you was in the business before the pandemic, you definitely see the di the difference now that the pandemic is here because people are seeing like their loved ones just die. Mm -hmm. Like I, I literally yeah. just had a friend who had a stroke, you know, and uh, they had COVID and it's just, it's craziness, but it really opened the door. I can't even say a door. It, it knocked that mug down. Like... <laughs> For me to be able to come in and teach about, you know, all these different, uh, uh, how can I say it? Um, these writers, let's just say writers for life uh -huh. insurance policies. Because like even my friend who had a stroke, you know, he had a life insurance policy that had something called living benefits. And living benefits mm -hmm. allow you to accelerate your death benefit while you're still living. It's completely free. You don't have to pay it back. You don't have to pay for the rider. Like it's just money that's just sitting there in case you get sick, you know? And um, so, yeah, I, I absolutely love teaching on it, but yeah, it, it's a huge difference now. It's like a built-in stimulus, huh? It's a built-in stimulus. I like that. You can look at it that way. So yeah, if, if you have like, for instance, you have like $100,000 like in life insurance, which is, that's a very small policy. But if you have that and let's say 30 days later, you got sick, got stroke, you know, a heart attack or just 
terrible car accident, whatever, you can actually accelerate up to 100% of your death benefit. And that's like, not all companies are like that, but the ones that I work with and specialize with my private clients, that's who that's who we do. But anyway, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing opportunity to like just get out there and teach more to the community so they can make sure they're properly protected. Now, do you have like a light illuminating? Why your face be glowing and going dark? You got like a bunch of different lights hitting your face. I do. I listen when I tell you. I can't. I'm not gonna tell you why I was late. But listen, I we here. <laughs> we here, bitch. bitch. We here. Come on, we here. Let's keep it moving. <laughs> I can't with you. <laughs> All right, so let's we're talk here. about we're here. Let's give them three secrets or three recipes to uh, becoming a six-figure entrepreneur. What would be number one for you? Um, I think my number one would be knowing what your most viable product is. Okay, most viable product is the product um, that you may not even know that you have. Okay, it could be a book. It could be your the information that you have in your head that you need to create a course around. Um, it could be a podcast, you know, but understand what your most viable product is and launch it, brand it, do everything you need to do with it, make it pretty, package it up real nice, do whatever the work is that needs to go into it and launch it. That's your first thing. But if you don't know what it is, think about the thing that you enjoy teaching, okay? Because mm. we are in the we are in the age of information. Information is everywhere. And a lot of people want to become experts, but you don't understand how you're already an expert. Mm. I was uh, talking to someone who used to work for the IRS, you know, and she worked in a, a certain department of the IRS that worked with transportation, you know, and taxes for transportation. And I'm like, baby, you got a course already. You know? Already. Yeah, already. You know, and so just think about what you love to teach on, what you like to speak on, your hobbies, etc., and what you're really great at, and create your MVP, your most viable product. Okay. And then get ready to launch that. Um, I would say the second thing is look all around you. Everybody should be considered a potential client. Okay or a potential customer, everybody, like don't count nobody out. Some people who you think would be the oddest person or the oddest client or the oddest customer for you would be sometimes your biggest sellers, you know, your biggest ticket, your biggest ticket clients, you know? So don't count out anyone. Don't count out anyone on your list. I don't know if you have an email list, a text list or whatever, but if even if you don't have a list, get started with that list, okay? Let's even go there get started with that list with your warm market with your family your friends get that list together and let them know this is what your business is and this is what you're launching and you will love their support thirdly i would say people don't know how to ask they don't understand the ask the ask is so big it is so important um i learned about how to ask way back in my little nonprofit days okay mm. when you're around all these different corporate sponsors and they're asking you you know well what how can we help you know what is it that you're looking for they're waiting for you to ask they want you to ask <laughs> for their money you know and they want you to have a specific number that you can ask for you know so know how to ask. And that ask can be as simple as, you know what, this is what I'm doing. This is what I have. I'm ready to launch. May I be able to, you know, uh, present to you the offer of getting a $5,000 grant from you. This is all we need. And with that $5,000 grant, this is what it's going to pay for. It's going to pay for water. It's going to pay for cookies. It's going to pay for all these different things, you know? So you just make sure you know what number you're wanting to ask and just put it out there. But the, investors are waiting to give it away you know like literally they are waiting like i've seen so many people on clubhouse because i'm new to clubhouse and i've seen so many people on clubhouse like damon john and i mm -hmm. mean just uh, Billy Jean marketing, like all these people, all these like multimillionaires and billionaires, they're on Clubhouse just like looking for somebody to just invest yep. in because they know they're going to get their money back some kind of way, whether it's a tax write off if the, biz if the business fell or whether it's a multi million dollar deal that the, you know, this new startup, you know, ends up producing. So, yeah, put your ass out there. Not your ass, but your ask. <laughs> you might want to put both of them out there, fans. Now you can't, how you gonna get the ass without your ass? Now you got to put both of them out there, okay? Risk it. <laughs> you know, listen, earlier when you talked about $40,000 in six weeks, I was like, she got to be having a whole host of, she's a madam. That's what you're thinking. People think that you're a madam. 
Listen, listen. I read somewhere on your uh on your uh definition or the the uh um oh Jesus, this description for today. Someone mm-hmm. called me a juggernaut. I said, you know what? I refuse to be stopped because that's exactly what a juggernaut is, you know? And so I, I mean that's just that's 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 just that's just me. I, for me, it wasn't necessarily shocking. I think it was more shocking as in it's happening now. You know, because I have goals. These my goals are not some fairy tale. You know, when I was with my nonprofit and like I knew nobody. I had just moved back to Texas as an adult and I knew nobody. I had no connections. You know, I had not been there since I was eleven years old. You know, but when I started putting this idea out there, I had I had a lot of people tell me, Oh yeah, that's cute, you know. Oh, that that'll be nice, you know, as if it wasn't gonna happen. No it's going to happen, <laughs> you know, with or without you, you know? And so that's just how I am when it mm. comes to, you know, they call it manifesting now, but that's just how I am when it comes to reaching my goals and making my own dreams come true. It's not a question of if it's going to happen. It's a matter of wh- when, you know? So. Yeah. A lot of times yeah. people get caught up in the, how it's going to happen. They, they yeah. feel like they, they can't manifest. They can't speak. It's going to happen yeah. because they don't, know in their mind how it's going to happen. I tell people the how is not your business. You it just is- know that it's going to happen and you keep speaking it until it happens. You got to be- you if you don't believe it, it's not going to happen anyway. Finch. Mm, Finch, come on here. You got <laughs> to know it. Like that is a word. You got to know it. And I think one of the shocking things when I first got started is because, you know, I was born and raised in a church Mm -hmm. and I was so surprised by how many pastors I had run into when I was like out there, you know, showing them my presentation and showing them my MOUs and like, you know, just all the stuff and just surprised and shocked by how many pastors was like, how are you doing this? And I'm thinking, (laughs) wait a minute, wait a minute. (laughs) I was like, now you the one you in the pulpit and like I just I was confused. I was confused. And so it just it it just it taught me a lot. But you got to know in your knower. I, I keep telling people, know in your knower. If you can see it in your mind, you can yeah. conceive it and hold it in your hand. You can have it. You know, it already exists. And that's like a whole different, you know, conversation. Uh, but especially when people are talking about manifesting and, mm-hmm. you know, reaching your goals and, you know, your affirmations and things of that nature. Like we throw those words around so loosely. And then you have all this whole generation of people, you know, doing these affirmations but their affirmations really aren't affirming anything they don't even know how to put the affirmation together you nope. know and it's like their affirmations is really like a fairy tale i don't believe in fairy tales like you have to actually have hardcore affirmations and goals and you have to speak it as if it already exists like yep. boom like and if it don't exist already physically around you that means that you have to make it first exist inside you you know and you have to feel that thing like come on now y'all play with me i see it in your eyeballs i see it in your eyeballs listen listen, i listen but i will i will keep going until (laughs) i continue to make the type of impact that i know I'm supposed to make. Like I'm not gonna stop, Finch. There is no stopping me. Okay. So you, you, you're not the you're not the little engine that could. You like the little Robin Hood that I, could. I'm right? the Robin Hood. You understand what I'm saying? I like to take the information that we have been excluded from for so many years. Like these little tax hacks and tax tricks and building wealth and like people tell you buy stocks. Don't buy stocks. You buy call options. Like, but you won't know that until you get around the right conversations and the right people. like That's what I like to take. I like to get the information. Let me be the ear to the ground and let me get into these elite circles of people that God continues to bless me with and let me mm-hmm. share that. You know, and because that's that's what breaks you free. You know, right. it's not the money but that breaks you free necessarily. It's the information because if I have the information, I can duplicate the money at any given time. Did you just drop a mic and leave? I, I, boop! <laughs> All right. So my final question to you right now, and then Mm -hmm. I want you to recap those three things that you talked about. Yeah. Outside of your children and outside of the the goals you have within your business, what motivates Robert? 
I am terrified of being. Can I say this word? I don't know. We are FCC approved for cussing. So you can say whatever you want to say here. I am terrified of being a broke ass bitch on welfare. (laughs) I'm dropping the cup on that one. I'm so serious. (laughs) Now, now, it, now, is that because you've been there before and you have this subtle fear of going back to that place that you feel like you, you've you been rescued from? I, I, I am terrified of it because when I had my son, I learned how hard parents fight to not be on welfare. Understand what I'm saying? Right. A lot of people who are getting SSI and SSDI and all these different things, it's not because they want to. Right, right. A lot of them don't want assistance. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I, I've been in the doctor's offices with different parents and families and single moms and single dads. They don't want it, you know? And all I can say is looking at my life, I've had nothing but eyeballs thrown at me. I've had nothing but statistics working against me from being a second grade dropout, as I say, on up to being a GED recipient. Like I have had nothing but the odds against me. And but when I had my son and he was diagnosed with autism, like I completely understood a whole different level of why some people are really impoverished. Like think about it, if you're not able to find childcare because your son has autism, like that's a big thing, you know. If you're not able to find freaking family members to come over and help you with your son so that you can go to work or so you can go do, you know, like that is is mm. terrible terrifying because they're terrified to watch your son you know they they have no idea about autism you know they're trying to figure it out too you know and so yeah like i've seen i've seen that life i've seen it even before my son i've seen it and especially with my son i see so many young families and young women that just struggle young men who just struggle because they don't want to repeat those those generational curses if you will you know that that generational curse of lack of information Mm -hmm. you know that generational curse of lack of support you know that generation generational curse of all these things that consumerism (laughs) you know that keeps you in poverty and so i'm i'm terrified of it I'm terrified. And having a special needs child puts you even more closer Mm -hmm. to that idea of, oh, my God, what if one day I don't have the right caregiver for my son? You know, what am I going to do? There is meeting with clients. There is no, you know, (laughs) uh, Mm -hmm. being able to schedule these events or have an interview that like there is no any of that. You know, and so it's just crucial to have certain certain things um, as a parent of, you know, different needs kids. Right. And I, again, that poverty keeps looking at me like, hey, and I'm like, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, when I tell you, I, I will do everything I need to do not to just get myself and keep like my kids from even having that mindset. You mm-hmm. know, because my daughter, she's seen me go from broke ass bitch <laughs> mm. to six figures. She was here already. Right. You know, and so my son was so young, he would have no idea. He, whatever, but she's seen it, you know. And so I just want to make sure that I'm doing everything possible that I'm completely emptied by the time I die because I refuse for anybody in any generation after me, and not just mm-hmm. my family, but families in the communities and anywhere that I travel to and, and help and teach. So, gotcha. Now, yeah. you say you say you're saying what I say often. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tell people every day, Robin, live full so yeah. at night you can rest yeah. empty. See, yeah. you don't want to ever take any I wish I could have, should have, or regrets mm-hmm. into your night because mm-hmm. the next day you got to start afresh with something, a whole new task of things that you need to do. So, yes, um, yes. I appreciate yes. you stopping by and oh. hanging out with me. Man, this has been so enlightening. Uh, if uh-huh. people want to connect with you online, how can they do so? Uh, just hit me up on Instagram. I'm Robin Hood, and you have to make sure you spell my name right. <laughs> well, spell it for him, Robin. Uh, it's I'm, I am, and Robin, that's my first name, R-O-B-I-N-N-E, 
Hood. So I'm Robin Hood. Um, you'll find me on I'm Robin Hood for Facebook and Instagram and just simply Robin Hood, R-O-B-I-N-N-E Hood um, on Clubhouse and Twitter. Yo, 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 yo. You're in the mix. The world's finest, man. DJ. Just like I have the radio on the telly. <laughs>